Hi, and uh, thank you all for staying for one of the late sessions today. Um, Padma, let's jump right in. Cisco networking giant for years. You've really been the glue for uh, connectivity for, for many, many years. And just like many of the big technology companies, you're now facing challenges and disruption just like other companies. So what is your primary strategy now for dealing with that? Yeah, you know, it's uh, amazing, actually. We are at a very interesting time in technology where everything we've created in the last 10 years is getting disrupted. And it's getting disrupted uh, not only the, in, in a big way, but actually how quickly it's getting disrupted. And, and the main reason for that is we are moving away from a, in information technology, a desktop and a server, client-server architecture, to the explosion of mobile and, and cloud right at the back end. But what's more interesting is what's going to happen in the next 10 years. Uh, we expect the next 10 years, the future, to be about what we call the internet of everything. Um, so today, only if in the physical world, only 0.6% of what can be connected are connected. So 99.4% of our world is still unconnected. And the potential when we bring all these things online is going to be amazing. It's going to change every industry. So we actually have a short video clip that we want to show right now uh, to sort of bring home that point, and then we'll talk about the details. Great. Can we see the video, please? The internet. Once here, now it's suddenly everywhere, unleashing a world of opportunities. The internet of things. It's already here in cars that drive themselves. Here, where gate sensors put fans in their seats faster. Here, bringing doctors and patients together virtually. Smart buildings are already reducing energy costs here. Drones use infrared imaging to detect crop failure here, while sensor-driven pumps conserve water here. Networked sensors and cameras let students in and keep trouble out here while smart vending machines personalize the shopping experience here. The Internet of Things is cutting unscheduled downtime here. It's turning data into profits, streetlights into guardians, and mines into safer, more profitable production centers. Here, millions of containers can now be tracked in real time from a single location, while connected emergency vehicles turn the lights green here. And playgrounds are now safe places to play here. Welcome to a world of things, already making a world of difference in so many ways, in so many places. Where will you take it next? So it strikes me that part of this transition really is from almost a very hardware-connected world to a software-connected world and a wireless world. How does Cisco make that transition? Where are you headed? with these kinds of initiatives? So we actually think when we go to this future, which we are beginning to see the implications of it, both in the consumer and in the industrial space, uh, we'll move to a completely different stack. And the entire stack, everything from the chipset, uh, the semiconductors that go into the hardware, to the systems, to the software stack, the operating uh, software, operating um, systems, as well as applications, everything will be disrupted. Uh, our vision is to provide that connected platform. So the connectivity, for example, where the network now is going to be much more distributed, there has to be closer uh, uh, compute capability, closer to where the sensors are getting connected. So we want to provide the connectivity platform and create a um, analytics opportunity for all these sensors, because the network actually sees all of this data that is uh, of all the things that are getting connected to the internet. So is it, in effect, something resembling an operating system that interconnects these things, or is it simply to collect data and feed back information? No, it's really, I, you know, we think of it as the operating system for the internet of everything. And so what I mean by that, if you look at uh, architectures, traditionally the network has been the only thing that so far has not been programmable. You know, you can program a, a compute, you can program storage, you can't program the network up until this point, and we're making that possible as we go into the future so that application developers and startups that create all kinds of applications for the Internet of Things, the network will feed to them the right intelligence so that data can be processed faster 
and decisions can happen more real time. So you mentioned analytics. That sounds a little bit like Accenture territory, right? The sort of consulting service part. Is that a place where you're also headed? I think we think of it more as all of this will be enabled through data virtualization and software, not so much people analyzing business processes, which is what used to happen in the past. So we're building the software capabilities where you can take the data that the network sees and provide analytics, meaning decision-making processes for different industries in manufacturing, retail, transportation, all of that. In Dublin, actually, we're working on a connected rail system with the government. Has that required a, a big turnover in your engineering yes. uh, capabilities? It's a big transformation for the company. And I don't know if people know this, but Cisco is a very acquisitive company. We are made up of 170 acquisitions. Uh, we're actually, this in December, we'll be celebrating our 30th birthday. Uh, we've been around for 30 years. And so over the 30 years, we've acquired about 170 companies. And we also invest very much. You know, one of the reasons I'm here is to look at all the startups that are, uh, that are creating value for us. And we, are, we have $2 billion under management. So we look at innovation not just within the company, but we're very aware that we will get disrupted. And oftentimes, we disrupt ourselves as a company. So acquihire is obviously an important Acquihires, part of what Acquihires, as well as businesses. We sometimes acquire large public companies so that we can move right. into different right. spaces. So, in this brave new world, as we've seen already, security is a huge concern. How do you uh, build that into your business, and how do you manage it and, and sell security as a part of your offering in a way that makes companies feel better? Security is actually, I think, going through a major transformation. One of the uh, earlier panelists said something interesting. He said, we, you know, we already I gave up privacy years ago. It was after Snowden that we realized we gave it up. It was an interesting comment. But I think you know, security, if you think about it, uh, used to be a different agenda depending on which industry you were in. For the media and content industry, for example, sec security was all about digital rights management and rights management. Uh, for a banking company, security was about data security. Uh, for a consumer internet company, you were worried about site hijacking and you know, DDoS um, attacks. And if you're an enterprise company, you're worried about networking company. I think going forward, security really has to, you know, every company has to worry about all of these, right? Because in the internet of things, uh, every company becomes a digital company. So your security agenda really has to encompass all these things. Security really has to become a platform going forward. It may be, the way I like to think about it, perhaps one day we'll have a security platform with APIs, and as the hackers and attacks get more sophisticated, we can actually integrate protection mechanisms quicker versus having to go back and, and remediate what already occurred. So I think we will see a big transition in how security is built and delivered also. Although APIs sounds vulnerable just based on what we know about the way a lot of APIs have behaved in the past. Yeah, but there's already companies creating mechanisms to do API management, recognize what gets put into the system. One of the things that we feel, you know, previously when we were in the client-server era, people used to spend money before an attack. A lot of the things that companies like Cisco and our peers in the industry built were things like firewalls, et cetera. They were all targeted at preventing an attack, but now we all recognize we're going to get attacked no matter what. So we're willing to spend, that spend is going to shift to during and after an attack. So how do I know, um, you know, analyze the data, tell me that I am going through an attack now, and how do I remediate and come up faster? So we'll see that, I think, as the investment shifts, we'll see new kinds of technologies be born. I want to pivot and talk about uh, the treatment of women in the technology industry. Um, there has been a lot of discussion in some panels about women in education and technology and so on. I want to talk a little bit more about behavior. Uh, in the US, the National Football League has recently been dealing with a lot of incidents involving its players and even its executives. And it is now taking a very um, no tolerance position. And even before there's been any jurisprudence, the player is suspended, uh, they don't play, um, executives the same thing. Is it time for something like that in the technology industry where the big companies that are almost uniformly run by men uh, sort of stand up and say, you know what, we're not going to employ those people any longer, we're not going to recruit them 
no matter how good of an engineer they are, if they have that track record. Um, and we're not going to invest in companies if they have that track record. Yeah, you know, I mean, my belief is uh, women's issue is really all of our issues. I think it, it needs to be addressed, right? Uh, there are problems right through the value chain. How do you get women more interested in technology? How do you uh, encourage them to have careers in technology, in the tech industry? And actually, the numbers are even worse if you look at how many technical women are in the technology industry. Um, and you know, as one of the previous panelists said, women look up, but they also look around. And I think you know, this is where role models and having the right behaviors uh, there, is no, there should be no tolerance at all for bad behavior, that bad behavior in any company, in any industry. Um, and I think that responsibility rises with both men and women. Um, and I, you know, I, I think that people speaking up more and women seeing more other role models um, goes a long way. There is no excuse for pay inequality. The numbers are actually shocking. I know, so I encourage women to speak up when they see this, and I encourage men to take a stand and and be firm against not tolerating behaviors. How, how, is the, how is the diversity at Cisco? Yeah, it's uh, slightly better. It's not, uh, it's not something that I'm proud of. It's, I think, 20% like most tech companies. Uh, we do have a lot of senior women in C-level positions. Our CIO is a woman. Our CMO is a woman. Uh, one of our lead finance experts is a woman. So a lot of women at the top. What we find in our company, which is probably true for every tech company, every Silicon Valley company, but global tech companies, we, we recruit, uh, our percentage of recruitment is reasonably high in how many women we recruit from, from colleges. We lose them after they're in, in the workforce for about five to six years. And we've been trying to figure out why this is. And you know, my, this is anecdotal. I don't have data for this, but I spend a lot of my time talking to women, you know, I really uh, would like to see this change. Oftentimes, when, you're in, when you've been working for about six or seven years, it's at that stage, man or woman has to make a decision whether you want a career path as a leader or a manager, or you want to be an individual contributor and be a fellow or contribute uh, deeply technically. And I think this is where there's stereotypes that are not appealing to women on either of those ladders. You know, if they look up and they see people in managerial roads, they're expected to dress a certain way, behave a certain way, that's very alienating to women. And if they look up on the technical individual contributor role, they look at role models who, are, um, who dress a certain way, look a certain way, talk a certain way, that's also alienating to them. And so that's the point where I think they choose to check out or leave. So I think if we can encourage women to stay through that and change those role models, we'll see more traction in the higher levels in companies. So you occupy, obviously, this very pivotal role in this very pivotal company. Um, what is keeping you up at night now? Yeah, what keeps me? So I run investments for Cisco. I run acquisitions for Cisco. I run the technology strategy. I have a huge responsibility um, uh, if inside the company and in the industry. What keeps me up at night is the pace of change. How quickly, like I was saying earlier, things are changing. Companies that have been um, you know, leaders in their market six years ago don't exist today. Uh, I read a report from um, uh, recently that was in Fast Company, I think, that said um, roughly 40% of uh, Fortune 500 companies will not exist in the next 10 years. Not, not only will they not be on the list, they won't exist. Um, which is actually a really interesting statistic. So that means companies have to constantly reinvent themselves and completely change their business models. Um, so the pace at which we have to change is what keeps me up at night. So you told me before we came on that you meditate for a few minutes every night before you go to sleep. Uh, does it help? Yeah, so I taught myself how to meditate uh, 20 years ago, and I couldn't do it for more than a minute. I couldn't sit still for more than a minute, let alone clear my mind. Uh, now I routinely do it for about 20 minutes every night before I sleep. It's sort of that last thing I do before I go to bed. Uh, it does help me a lot, and I actually do something that I call digital detox. Uh, I take one day in a week. Uh, usually it's a Saturday for me because I travel a lot for work. Um, and I, I try to do something in the physical world away from the di my digital world. I paint, I write poetry, I go for walks. I think you know, that's a form of meditation as well. Those kinds of things really help me. I think it, it um, I call it an exercise for my spirit um, because you know, my mind and my brain and my body gets exercised, but my spiritual 
uh, wellness is not usually taken care of. So it does help me. It helps me back it, up it, and look at things. If we all did it, would it slow the pace of change? <laughs> That's really the question. I don't know if it'll slow, but, but somebody spoke earlier, talked about clarity of purpose um, as a way of avoiding chaos in organizations. I think it was a gentleman from Asana uh, was talking about you know, effective leadership. And I think it definitely gives me clarity of purpose as a leader and uh, clarity of, uh, you know, I feel my role as a leader is to help other people be successful. And sometimes you measure, leaders often tend to measure their effectiveness or how good they are based on the number of decisions versus the quality of decisions. Uh, I think it definitely helps me improve the quality of the decisions I make. Great, thank you everyone. Thank you Padma very thank much. You.